The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. Also, as we approach the study of the Word of God, for the courtesy to others, have all cell phones turned off so that it's not a distraction. Anything that will make noise during the teaching of the Word of God because it's not only a distraction to others, but a distraction to me, and whether you know it or not, I make it look easy, but it's very difficult to concentrate while speaking. Now, we have the next few moments of silent prayer in order to follow 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together once again for the purpose of learning your word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate the portion of the word of God in which we will study into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now in your hands you have a picture of I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. I'm going to first read a couple of articles related to privacy. I've already had a lot of comments on what they think it is, if it's an illusion, etc. Uh, it's not an illusion. It's a place. And I'll tell you all about it shortly. But first of all, I'm going to go over a principle I gave you. It was principle number one. The environment of freedom is privacy, or privacy provides the environment for freedom. Under that, I've pulled up two articles that I'm going to read. One is from the Washington Times, mainstream media reporting, and it says the title, Obama administration had restrictions on the NSA, the National Security Agency, reversed and 2011. This is by Ellen Nakashima. The Obama administration secretly won permission from a surveillance court in 2011 to reverse restrictions on the National Security Agency's use of intercepted phone calls and emails, permitting the agency to search deliberately for Americans' communications in its massive databases, according to interviews with government officials and recently declassified material. Here we have unreasonable search and seizure of what we do in private. In addition, the court extended the length of time that the NSA is allowed to retain intercepted U.S. communications from five to six years, and more under special circumstances according to the documents, which include a recently released 2011 opinion by U.S. District Judge John D. Bates then Chief Judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. What had not been previously acknowledged is that the court in 2008 imposed an explicit ban at the government's request on those kinds of searches, that officials in 2011 got the court to lift the bar, and that the search authority has been used. Together, the permission to search and to keep data longer expanded the NSA's authority in significant ways without public debate or any specific authority from Congress. The administration's assurances rely on legalistic definitions of the term, quote, target, that can be at odds with ordinary English usage. The enlarged authority is part of a fundamental shift in the government's approach to surveillance, collecting first and protecting Americans' privacy later, which is, of course, impossible. Quote, the government says, we're not targeting U.S. persons, said Gregory T. Nojime, senior counsel at the Center for Democracy and Technology. But then they never say, quote, 
we turned around and deliberately searched for Americans' records and what we took from the wire. That, to me, is not so different from targeting Americans at the outset, end quote. The court decision allowed the NSA to query the vast majority of its email and phone call databases using the email addresses and phone numbers of Americans and legal residents without a warrant, according to Bates' opinion. The queries must be, quote, reasonably likely to yield foreign intelligence information, end quote, and the results are subject to the NSA's privacy rules. The court in 2008 imposed a wholesale ban on such searches at the government's requ request, said Axel Joel, Civil Liberties Protection Officer at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. The government included this restriction to, quote, remain consistent with NSA policies and procedures that NSA applied to other authorized collection activities, he said. But in 2011, to more rapidly and effectively identify relative foreign intelligence communications, quote, we did ask the court to lift the ban, ODNI General Counsel Robert S. Litt said in an interview. Quote, we wanted to be able to do it, he said, referring to the searching of Americans' communications without a warrant. Joel gave hypothetical examples of why the authority was needed, such as when the NSA learns of a rapidly developing terrorist plot and suspects that a U.S. person may be a conspirator. Searching for communications to, from, or about that person can help assess that person's involvement and whether he is in touch with terrorists who are surveillance targets, he said. Officials would not say how many searches have been conducted. The second article comes from Der Spiegel. Der Spiegel is a German publication far to the left of most American publications. Spiegel has learned from internal NSA documents that the U.S. intelligence agency has the capability of tapping user data from the iPhone, devices using Android, as well as BlackBerry, a system previously believed to be highly secure. German Chancellor Angela Merkel holds a BlackBerry Z10 smartphone. They put a picture of her with her smartphone in the air. Will the company face a setback following claims the NSA can spy on its phones? The United States National Security Agency Intelligence Gathering Operation is capable of assessing user data from smartphones from all leading manufacturers. Top secret NSA documents that Spiegel has seen explicitly note that the NSA can tap into such information on Apple iPhones, BlackBerry devices, and Google's Android mobile operating system. The documents state that it is impossible for the NSA to tap most sensitive data held on these smartphones, including contact lists, SMS traffic, notes on location information about where a user has been. It is possible. I might have said it is not possible. It says it is possible they can do this. Of course it is. Individuals can do this. The documents also, uh, in the internal documents, experts boast about successful access to iPhone data in instances where the NSA is able to infiltrate the computer a person uses to sync their iPhone. Many programs, so-called scripts, then enable additional access to at least 38 iPhone features. The documents suggest the intelligence specialists have also had similar success in hacking into Blackberries. A 2009 NSA document states that it can see and read SMS traffic, that's uh, uh, text messages. It also notes there was a period in 2009 when the NSA was temporarily unable to access BlackBerry devices. After the Canadian company acquired another firm the same year, it changed the way it compresses its data. But in March 2010, the department responsible at Britain's GCHQ intelligence agency declared in a top secret document he had regained access to BlackBerry data and celebrated with the word champagne. The documents also state that the NSA has succeeded in accessing the BlackBerry mail system, which is known to be very secure. This could mark a huge setback for the company, which has always claimed that its mail system is uncrackable. In response to questions from Spiegel, BlackBerry officials stated, it is not for us to comment on media reports regarding alleged government surveillance of telecommunications traffic. Well, since it is illegal for citizens to do these types of things, it is also illegal, or has been illegal, for the government to do those types of things. But now we live in a system in which those in authority have decided to live above the law. Hence, the environment of freedom, which is privacy, has been violated on all levels. All right, the picture. 
from my study earlier today from Josephus. Josephus was an unbeliever, but he was a historian during the time of Christ, and thereafter he witnessed the fall of Jerusalem in August of 70 AD, and he documented many of these things. And from his description of where Golgotha is, that is a picture of Golgotha, the front face of Golgotha, the top of which three crosses stood, the place, more than likely, where Jesus Christ was crucified. Now we know why it's called the place of skulls, if you look at it. Now in eternity past, our Lord Jesus Christ created the universe. Then at some point, he created the angels. And because of his righteousness, justice, and love, his very integrity, his very essence, means that he needed to also create with the angels these creatures had to have freedom or free will. The most beautiful of his creation, the highest ranking of all the angels, was Lucifer, the son of the morning. He's described as having the voice of a pipe organ. And he was loved by God and given high rank. He was also the first creature to revolt against God, using his volition to abuse his freedom. He was actually the most perfect creature God had ever made. And uh, as a result, uh, he became vain. He was actually created as a magnificent and beautiful cherub, the highest ranking of the angels. He was very vain about how he looked. Now my son's funny, he just uh, copies what other people say. But uh, when I comb his hair, which falls so gently into place, after I'm finished, he looks in the mirror and proudly states, I look like a present. Well, <laughs> a present. And that he is. He's, he's a present to me. So happy birthday, Luke. In between messages, I'll be giving him a call. That'll be our break. Well, my son, who, though very handsome, he does not even get close to the beauty of Satan. And we have to understand, too, that Jesus Christ loved his creation as his own. But due to his righteousness and justice, he had to judge Satan for his rebellion. And since Jesus Christ is omniscient, he knew he would have to do so. Now, when I say perfection, Satan had perfection. It was a superficial perfection. And that superficial perfection. He had everything going for him, but it was destroyed by inner pride and vanity. You can be the most beautiful person in the world, but if you're filled with pride and vanity, you're ugly. He became enamored with his own attractiveness. You can say he took himself too seriously. And if ever you run into people, and I'm sure we all have, who take themselves too seriously, you've run into a vain person. They have no self-deprecating humor or anything else. Because the other angels had been admiring him, and because he was the abject of adulation and adoration by all the angels, one day he said, I'm going to make myself like the Most High God. And when he said that, a revolt began against God. As a result, God sentenced him to the lake of fire. Satan appealed and said, how can a loving God send his own creation to the lake of fire? God accepted his appeal and thus the trial, the greatest trial of all history began. And so began the angelic conflict. As a result, we have to have the creation of a lower creature called mankind. And Jesus Christ created mankind knowing that Adam and Eve would fall and that all born from Adam and Eve, all of us, would be born spiritually dead but physically alive with no ability whatsoever to have a relationship with God. He knew that would happen. Yet, he gave us that freedom to make that choice. And he loved freedom so much knowing all of this in eternity past 
that he decided to give us freedom by going to the cross and dying as a substitute for us in order to offer us eternal life, all of which was done by his very own volition and choice. So therefore, we can see how much our Lord values freedom, all the concepts of freedom. He adores the concept that privacy is the environment of freedom. Property is the expression of freedom. Ownership is the manifestation of freedom. All of this, not only did our Lord create under a system of capitalism, but he also has given us a spiritual freedom that is far above and beyond anything we could ask or think. So it did become time for our Lord to go to the cross, and every category of people was represented there. There was Simon of Cyrene, a Jew who was analogous to those Jews of the dispersion. There was a thief on the cross who represented the immoral Gentile. There, too, were the prostitute and tax collectors, those of whom our Lord associated with most while on earth. The tax collectors were especially considered by the Jews to be traitors, for they were collect, uh, collecting revenue for Rome, and Judea was under the fourth cycle of discipline. There was a Roman centurion, too, who represented a Gentile functioning under the principles of divine establishment. Also, there were the moral degenerates, the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, who shouted insults toward our Lord as they strode around, making sure their gold-covered phylacteries could be seen by all, as they thrust their arms in the air in, di in indignation toward the Son of God. A phylactery was something that they tied on their arm and on the inside would be scripture. It was the time of Passover, and Simon of Cyrene, a Jew from the dispersion, had been anticipating his time of travel to Jerusalem. Many Jews had settled in Cyrene, Libya. There were upwards of 100,000 Jews who worshipped as Jews in Cyrene, Libya. And though the trip was long, Excitement began to build as he approached the hills of Hebron, or Hebron. And that's because once you approach those hills, you know that Jerusalem is near. And if you ever look at a picture of Jerusalem, it's in a very hilly area. It's elevation about 3,000 feet. As he approached from the south, he then turned eastward along the Sarok River. He crossed over ragged pathways, leaving behind jagged rocks, and the threat of bandits. And finally, finally he came into view of Jerusalem, the holy city. Scriptures from the Pentateuch came to mind as he imagined that he got to see what Moses never got to see, the promised land. As he entered the city's gates, he noticed that this was no usual Passover. The commotion was even greater than he could have ever imagined. The shouts of the people reached his ears. Are they shouting crucify him, he thought to himself. An execution on this most holy of days and in Jerusalem? No, it can't be, but it is. It's against their law. But is it happening? Yes, I hear them more clearly now. Have the Romans invaded? He must have surely asked himself as he saw Roman centurions everywhere. Their legions and insignia were unmistakable as he himself had seen them in Cyrene, Libya, which was part of a Greek colony of Rome. It is against our law to execute anyone during Passover. How dare the Romans mock our holy traditions? He must have thought with indignation. His ears guided him to the heart of the commotion. What his eyes saw, he could not believe. There was a man carrying a cross, stripped of flesh, red with blood. How is this man even alive, he thought. 
He wanted to get a closer look to make sure that his eyes were not deceiving him. Then suddenly he saw the man collapse under the weight of the cross. Get up, you king of the Jews! It was then Cyrene noticed the thorns fastened around his head as a crown. He could see blood and sweat mixed dripping down his face. How can this man see, he asked himself. He, cr he heard the crowd shout, You made the lame walk, now leap up and carry your cross, they mocked. He then began to recall many of the scriptures he'd memorized from the Torah, passages such as Isaiah 52, 14. Just as there were many, just as there were many who were appalled at him, this is Isaiah 52, 14, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. He had to get closer. Could I have come to pass over to see the Messiah, he pondered. Then he felt large hands lift him off the ground and nearly hurl him closer to the cross. You carry it for him, the Roman centurion ordered. He did so reluctantly, but he knew better than to disobey the commands of a centurion. He positioned his strong body under the cross and lifted it with relative ease. The man behind him rose to his feet also. He was appalled at the very sight of the man. He could hear the women wailing and weeping uncontrollably following the procession. So many would not weep for a mere criminal, he thought. Then he saw Jesus turn his head and look at the women. He said to them in Luke 23:28, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never suckled. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. This man shows concern for others while he himself is in such torment. And does he prophesy too? The women were shouting, Lord. Some were crying out the name Jesus. And he heard some shout, He is the Christ, the Son of God. Is this the Son of God? Simon pondered. Is all the scripture he had learned in youth finally made sense to him? Is this the Christ who continues to prophesy so? Jesus continued in Luke and said, For if people do these things when the tree is green, meaning under prosperity, what will happen when it is dry? Truly, this is the Son of God, Simon believed. As they reached the top of the skull called Golgotha, a Roman centurion took the cross from Simon, but Simon stayed nearby amazed by all that what was happening. Every emotion man could experience Simon was experiencing. Joy mixed with sorrow, confidence mixed with helplessness. This is what he must do for us. This is what he must do for me. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. I'm quoting here from Luke, by the way. Verse 35 now. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save, save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine mixed with drugs and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Of course, uh, our Lord did not partake of the uh, painkiller, as it were. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults, insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. 
But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he asked, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished just, justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now prior to all this, prior to when Simon of Cyrene saw our Lord totally bashed into nothing but meat, hamburger, what had happened was our Lord went before the authorities and was lashed. Lashed to a pulp by the cat of nine tails, in other words, a leather strap embedded in which were all sorts of things that would cut. Uh, embedded in there would be things like uh, iron type things that looked like teeth, things that were designed to rip out flesh, things that would grip the flesh as it came down, and then when jerked back, would simply rip the flesh right off. Our Lord was literally skinned alive. He didn't say a word. He didn't moan. He didn't groan. And they were shocked by this. In fact, it sent them into a frizzy. Why doesn't this man say anything? Why doesn't this man cry out? But as a lamb before the one who cuts his throat is silent, so he remained silent. So they whipped him all the harder, trying to get a reaction, but our Lord would not react, not a peep. It became so bloody, so awfully terrible, that the leader finally said, Stop it, we're not here to kill the man. So they stopped. But the damage had been done. His flesh had been ripped right out. Then as he got up and he joined a procession, even before getting to the point to where he would pick up the cross, people were shouting insults at him, slapping him, spitting in his face, grabbing at his beard and ripping the hair out in clumps. Now, I used to have a goatee, and I shaved it off. And the skin was so tender underneath the lip part, above, the, uh, under the nose, that when I shaved it off, it just took the first, or almost down, almost all the layers of skin right off with the hair. It caused it to be very sore and red and puffy and all that. So imagine the pain of having someone not all at once rip your hair out of your face, but to grab it and rip out a clump here and someone else would grab it and rip out a clump there until they ripped his entire beard right out. Yet he said not a word. He did not react when slapped. He did not react when spit upon. He did not react to any of the pangs of having his hair ripped right out of his face. He did not react when the burden of the cross was put upon him. And when he lifted the cross, when he began to carry it, now highly weakened, a normal man would have died by now. And then right at the moment when he lost control of the cross and could take it no more, along came a positive, someone positive, Simon of Cyrene, who believed in Christ and had to carry his cross for him. Then the cross was put into a hole with a thud. His nail, the nails had already been pierced through his hands and feet. And when the cross jerked, so did the flesh jerk. Yet he said not a peep. Then he hung there, along with 
two other thieves. The other thieves had received painkiller, a very strong drug that had been mixed in wine. It says wine and vinegar. What it was, it's a cocktail of narcotics. Jesus had refused the narcotic because he wanted to think clearly as all the sins of the world were being imputed to him and judged because that would be the most excruciating part of all his journey. And so it was about noon, verse 44, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun had stopped shining. There was no storm. The sun literally stopped shining. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two. A whole other doctrine. What it revealed on the inside of the temple was nothing. There was nothing there. During this three hours of darkness, from noon until three in the afternoon, the sun was blotted out, meaning there was supernatural darkness. Not only the sun, but the stars and the moon, everything was blotted out. If you've ever been inside a cave, or done some cave tour, and as part of the tour they cut out the lights to let you see what it would look like without electricity, or a lantern, you see a supernatural darkness. It's as if you're blind. Everybody was blinded. Why? Because what was about to happen to our Lord Jesus Christ was to be invisible. Everything was visible to that point. Now it was invisible. People could not see what was happening. Hence we begin the time of invisible heroes from that time forward. Everything becomes invisible to the hoi polloi and to everyone. It's spiritual. And no one could see as all the sins of the world were imputed to Jesus Christ and judged. And then finally, he cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was he forsaken? He was forsaken for you and for me. He died as a substitute for us so that we might have eternal life. He died for our freedom. That's how much our Lord appreciates freedom. Not only that, He created it. And that's why as we went through our study, we went over the worst of sins and the worst of sins of gossip, maligning, judging, telling a lie in a court of law, murder, those sins violate freedom the most. That's why they're the worst. Other sins violate freedom too, but to a lesser degree. Fornication, adultery, those violate principles of freedom, for it violates the idea of right man, right woman, and marriage, which is the second of the divine institutions, and so forth. There are other sins, too, that are of the type that destroy freedom as well, but they are lesser in their scope and their reach. Drug abuse destroys freedom. It actually destroys the freedom of the individual using drugs. They become enslaved, so it destroys their own freedom, and they become a pain to everyone around them because they usually get involved in theft. Alcohol abuse, alcoholism, that destroys the person involved, and they become dependent and a slave to it, and that destroys their freedom. So you can see how all of it is related to freedom in some way. Then at the end he said, Father, into my hands, or, or into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he had breathed his last. But before he had breathed his last, and before he had said this, he said, Tetelestai. It is finished in the past, 
with results that go on forever. Meaning that our Lord Jesus Christ had completed the task before he died physically. So the blood that he shed is analogous to our salvation, but doesn't provide our salvation. What provides our salvation was his volition, in which the cup was poured upon him, all the sins of all of human history. Then it was finished, and it was finished while he was still alive. So he did not die physically as a substitute for us. He died spiritually as a substitute for us. And for three hours he was separated from God. He had never been separated from God the Father or God the Holy Spirit before. And actually he would not be separated from God the Holy Spirit. But he had never been separated from God the Father ever before. But for three hours there was a separation in which God the Father, in essence, turned his back on him. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. So the centurion believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only is God the author of human freedom, but above all, he is the author of spiritual freedom, which cannot be corrupted by any system devised by man, devised by the machinations of Satan's system, cosmos diabolicus. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3, Verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is deity. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We've studied this passage before. But we all, with an unveiled face, looking into a mirror to produce a reflection of the glory of the Lord, and being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, as it were from the Spirit of the Lord. Into that same image from glory to glory, that sounds redundant, but it's not. It has meaning. Some people read the Bible and read from glory to glory, and they just think the Bible's being poetic. No. The Bible means something here. From glory, the prototype spiritual life that our Lord lived, to glory, the protocol spiritual life that he's passed down to each and every one of us as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have both equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the protocol plan of God and the freedom to do so, and also the freedom to throw it away for a mess of pottage. So spiritual freedom is the environment for all believers to execute the unique spiritual life. This is what 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 is talking about when it talks about freedom. It's talking about spiritual freedom as the environment for all believers to execute the unique spiritual life of all time. The believer must never use his spiritual freedom to endanger or hurt the divine blessings which accompany such freedom. Any believer who do, does not execute the four mechanics and, object, and objectives of the Christian way of life is hurting this nation. Any believer uninterested in the metabolization of Bible doctrine is a traitor to his country. And more than that, He's an antichrist, a traitor to God's protocol system. The believer must use his spiritual freedom to advance through the function of the four spiritual mechanics and thereby attain the two tactical and strategic objectives of the spiritual life. Our unveiled face is the positive believer in the consistent function of the two power options. 
Again, that's the filling of God the Holy Spirit plus metabolized doctrine in the stream of consciousness. This is where you develop the mirror of the Word of God and we look into the Word of God to produce the reflection of the humanity of Christ in hypostatic union. Galatians 4.9 summarizes the concept in its last part of the verse until Christ is formed in you. And if you'll turn to Galatians 4.19 we can read the whole thing. For the verse indicates many things but first of all let's read it. My dear children for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Galatians. And this verse indicates the pains a pastor goes through in teaching the Word of God to people who've been led astray. The Galatians had been led astray by legalistic Jews who followed Paul wherever he went in order to discredit his message and to give a false message of works. Salvation by works, spirituality by works. So since Paul's motivation was pure, his motivation was for the formation of the protocol spiritual life within the Galatians. And it was very painful for him to see them all go astray. Very painful for me to see how many who in the past were so hot for the word to become lukewarm. It's painful. He describes the pain as being in the pains of childbirth. Why? For he anticipated, just as a woman anticipates a child to be born, that the Galatians would return to the spiritual life and have Christ formed in them. And that's exactly what occurred. In other words, they would follow the prototype spiritual life of Jesus Christ in its protocol form. And it only varies in two areas. First of all, the believer must constantly use the problem-solving device number one, rebound, 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Secondly, the believer must execute the protocol plan by being occupied with the person of Christ. And Christ, of course, never needed to be occupied with himself. So with those two exceptions, our spiritual life mirrors the spiritual life our Lord lived while on the earth. Though since the completion of the canon of Scripture, of course, we do not have the gift of miracles which was a license or a credit card to show and to also fulfill prophecy for our Lord that he would heal the lame, cause the blind to see, raise the dead, etc. None of us have that power. But when he went under testing, he went into the desert for 40 days and out comes the theological concept of kenosis, not gnosis, but kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. It's a theological concept, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. You're learning something that 0.01% of the Christian world probably even knows about. Kenosis. What is kenosis? It means that Jesus Christ would never rely on the power of his deity in order to fulfill his plan on the earth because he was living the prototype and if he had in any moment had utilized his divine essence, his deity, to get through some test then it would have knocked out the prototype spiritual life for us because we can't use deity. We're not deity. But he never failed in that manner. In fact, he went 40 days without food. He was at the point of starvation. He was at that point when the hanger, hunger pangs become so intense that any normal person would start 
eating their belt, the leather on their belt. It's happened when people go into starvation. Our Lord was starving. And under this evidence testing that he went through, Satan came to him personally and said, If thou art the Son of God, and he said it in such a way as to say it this way, If thou art the Son of God, and you are, simply turn these stones into bread. A strong temptation for a starving person because he could not rely on his deity and turn the stones into bread and then follow through by turning Satan into a gingerbread man. None of that could occur. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And if we were here, we would have no hope. But what he did was respond with what? Bible doctrine from the Old Testament. He quoted an Old Testament scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, we live by Bible doctrine and not by bread alone. We do need bread. That's why he said bread alone. And so he won that part of the evidence testing, though more came. But the doctrine of kenosis says he could not use any part of his deity to solve the problem, and he never did. You say, what about the miracles? The miracles were performed under the power of the Spirit, and since the, it was not yet the completed canon of Scripture, and since he had to fulfill prophecy, these miracles were all, all part of it, but not part of our spiritual life. Miracles were a part of the life of Peter and Paul. But as the canon of Scripture was being completed, Paul lost the gift of healing as he could not even heal his best friend, one of his best friends. And as the canon of Scripture became complete, all those temporary gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians ended once the fullness came, and the fullness, or the completeness, I believe it might say once the, what it means is the completion of the canon of Scripture. Then we lose those spectacular, or what humans think are spectacular spiritual gifts, such as healing, the gift of tongues, etc. It's no longer needed. But we've studied that under the concept of dispensations. So that's what kenosis means. So the believer must execute the protocol plan by being occupied with the person of Christ. So the function of spiritual freedom is based on the cognition and utilization of the spiritual skills, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, the power of metabolized doctrine, the utilization of those ten problem-solving devices on the flat line of the soul which include Rebound, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, the faith rest drill, grace and doctrinal orientation, a personal sense of destiny, personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind, impersonal love for all mankind, and personal love for God the Father make up the integrity envelope or sharing the love of God, then moving to sharing the happiness of God until finally the ultimate of occupation with the person of Jesus Christ. So spiritual freedom is the basis for equal opportunity for every church age believer to execute the protocol plan of God for the church. We have equality to succeed or fail under the freedom that God has provided. Most believers today in these United States have chosen to fail and that's the reason why we are losing out on our freedom in a most horrific way. And it will come in a great shock wave suddenly. Seven times worse than 9 11. Seven times worse for our economy, as we will study under the five cycles of discipline. Not only when you move from the third to the fourth cycle. There's an intensification of the first, second, and third cycles seven times over. 
along with the administration of the fourth cycle of discipline. You get a taste of spiritual freedom at salvation the moment you believe in Christ. For God the Holy Spirit at that moment enters you into what's called the divine dynosphere or divine power sphere. That is, you receive the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit and at least for a moment or a time period until you sin, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Once you sin, you grieve and quench the Spirit and must utilize 1 John 1, 9. That's why the new believer must as quickly as possible understand the importance of 1 John 1, 9 and come to understand that John, that 1 John 1, 9 is the John 3.16 of Christendom, meaning that John 3.16, by believing in Christ, all of your pre-salvation sins were forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 means after believing in Christ, if you name your sin, that sin is forgiven plus any unknown sin you've committed up until that point. So therefore, John 3, or 1 John 1, 9 is the John 3.16 of Christendom. Your spiritual freedom is destroyed by the function of the arrogant skills. They include self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And you run on this spiral until you die the sin face to face with death without rebound. But self-justification keeps you from rebound. You say to yourself, I have a right to be angry. No one notices me, or you come from disappointment and frustration. No one listens to me. No one cares for me. Self-absorption. Self-deception, I had a right. Self-justification, I did this because so-and-so did this. It's their fault. As Moses said to the people when he got involved in this for the one recorded time while he was out in the desert with the Exodus generation, when he struck the rock, instead of speaking to the rock, he was punished. And instead of naming his sin to God, he went to the people and said, Because of you, God is angry with me. Self-justification said, I had a right to be angry. Self-deception said, God's angry with me because of you. And self-absorption was how he felt sorry for himself under that circumstance of not being able to go into the land, but God shows no partiality. Moses recovered, and then he died under dying grace on top of a mountain. The believer can live and function without temporal freedom. That is, we can lose all of our freedom, and we're losing it in terms of human freedom. But, you cannot execute the protocol plan without spiritual freedom, and we have spiritual freedom. You can function in the spiritual life without temporal freedom, though there will be persecution. But as our Lord said, I was persecuted. What makes you think that you too, as being in me, will not be persecuted? Now what we will study next, in our next hour, after the intermission, would be blessing by association, those things that are keeping this country going, along with the five cycles of discipline, and then uh, continue by wrapping up Sunday's messages. Now we have a break, an interlude, and I will... See if I can wish happy birthday to my son. No need for prayer, just uh, break time.